I want to thank you for coming here today. And as well, we open up the service, we have a few announcements for you that we want to remind you about. And the first one being, we have our celebration renovation next Sunday that we want to remind you about. And with that, we will have no Sunday school uh, during that time. And so we want to see everybody out here at 10 o'clock for an extended cafe celebration. And we will be celebrating the opening of our cafe after all the hard work and all the giving from our church members. And so it will be a great time of uh, thanking the Lord and all uh, his faithfulness and us being able to renovate these facilities. As you've noticed, over the last about two years, we've been working on the facilities to get them up to snuff for the Lord. And so it'll be an awesome Sunday of us celebrating the hard work and the faithfulness the Lord has had and the faithfulness from our church family. And from what I hear, we're supposed to have a special guest uh, musician or, or musical talent here with us next Sunday. And so be anticipation for that. Uh, for this event and also uh, our pastry, pastry chef won't be here next Sunday and so we want to have uh, extra uh, some snacks and stuff during that time so if you're able to help and bring some baked goods during that time please let us know in the office ahead of time so that we can plan out accordingly and so uh, please let us know and so we can plan that out and we thank you for that as well. And let Betty know, and she also needs helpers in the kitchen. So Betty, you find her today, or let her know this week, and she can uh, get that all set up, and we thank you for that. Um, and also, uh, we have uh, coming up uh, this Wednesday night, uh, Pray First at 6 o'clock, and so we appreciate you coming out together as a church family, praying together, and we want to make sure that prayer is number one in our life, and as a church family, we're coming together on this Wednesday at 6 o'clock for Pray First. And so we, we thank you for coming again together for Pray First. Let us stand as we open up the service together in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to come together here to worship together. Father, we ask now that you pour out your Holy Spirit on this place. You grab a hold of our hearts and grab a hold of our attention so that we can hear your voice and that we can hear you and feel you moving in our lives. Father, make us new people in you. In your name we pray these things, Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing. You'll notice today we have a, a praise team that uh, is a little different looking than what we've had. I heard someone laugh. <laughs> but we're glad for them. The Voices of Praise is helping me today. Let's give them a good
glad that you're in church with me today. Can you do that?
get ready for prayer. We have a number of teens next weekend going up to TNT. So I'd like to ask for Brandon and Thomas and Sam, Ian, for you guys to come up if you would. Kneel at the altar. Anybody, if you would, come surround them. Pray for protection for the Lord to speak to these teens while they're up there at Trebekah's campus. that are in front of us here right now. Father, we ask now to protect them and myself as we and, and about a hundred other teenagers from Southern Florida partner with around 2,000 other teenagers and youth sponsors from all over South, Southern, Southeastern United States as we all go up to Trebekah's campus for TNT, top Nazarene talent. Father, we ask that as we go up there that you protect us in our travels. Father, we ask that you be with us on the bus ride and begin to minister to these kids this week as we go up there. And that you begin to build friendships over this time period and over the time of exhaustion and over the time of them playing sports and, and, and quizzing and all the other various things that they're doing together, Father. Father, as they're going through this time, we ask that you help them to realize that everything comes from you. And that they get to learn about the gifts and the talents that you've given them and how they're able to use them for you. And Father, that they get to learn about those talents and how they can use them in various ways to further your kingdom and impact the world for you, Jesus. And how the world will say that they, can, they can't play basketball, or they can't play football, or they can't do these sports, or math, or, or what, build a chair, whatever it is that they're really good at, Father. They can't do that and, and tell people about Christ. That you will go into their life, and you'll show them a plan and a dream of how they can reach people for you. That you'll breathe into them new visions and dreams how they can reach people for you. And so, Father, as they go up to this, this weekend, or this extended week of going up there to Trebekah's campus, Father, we ask that you drown out the things of this world, that you help them to stay focused, and to learn about you, that you help them to submit under authority as they'll be away from their parents for a few days, and that they'll learn about you through the times of exhaustion and as the barriers are broken down that you will make yourself known and just like Mark Anthony was able to figure out something on, and how to reach people through action sports they too will figure out how they can reach people through their gifts Father use those talents use their dreams Father Give them excitement to reach people for you. Put a dream in their heart, Father, so that moving forward when they get back, that they have a goal and a vision. Something in their mind that they know what to do and they can strive towards. And so moving forward from this point, they know where they're going. They know that dream. And yes, over time, as they become older and wiser, that dream may, may, may be get modified. <laughs> But they know the overall goal. And that's reaching people for you with the gift that you've given them. Father, we ask that you help us as a church to pray for these students, to walk alongside them and to teach them about these gifts and talents, to, to take time, to, to, to devote time to disciple them, to teach them about Jesus, to teach them about the Old Testament and the New. Show them who Christ is through our daily walk. Father, help us to 
be the church of today and to teach the church of tomorrow. And Father, as we do that, help us to partner alongside of church members that are sick and in need and hurting. Help us to pray for them and to put our arms around them and to love them. We have church members that are in the hospital sick and hurting, Father. We, we raise them up right now, Father. We ask that you be with them right now and their families. We're asking for healing, Father. We're asking for medical miracles, Father. We're asking for miraculous miracles, Father. We're just asking for you to move. Father, help us to show these youth what it is to spread the gospel. So help us to invite people to church to get to know who you are. And to show them the example of inviting people to church. And so give us the courage to go out into our communities, to our neighbors, and to our friends, and to people that don't know who you are, and to tell them about you, Jesus. To pray for them daily to walk alongside them, to show them who Christ is, and to show them an example of Jesus. So when the time comes and they don't know, how, they have nowhere else to turn, and when they ask us the question, we're ready, we're prepared, and we can tell them about you. Help us to be that example to these students. Now, Father, as we continue into this service, Moving forward, Father, help us to learn more about you through your word. Help us to dig deeper into your word and to do daily devotions and Bible studies. Help us to meet as the body of believers ever more. But then to take the knowledge that we're gaining in your word and then go out into the world and tell people about you. Not just to hoard the knowledge that we're learning, but to then use it and to tell people about Father, give us that courage. Give us that energy. Give us that vision so that we can go out to the world to be fisher of men as you call us to be. Jesus, we pray these things in your glorious name. that on Wednesday night we had missionary Craig Tippy here. How many of you were here to listen to that missionary give his amazing testimony? The thing I wanted to acknowledge too, uh, Ian, how many people did you bring Wednesday night? It was a lot. Was there eight? I thought I counted like eight new students. And I think that's amazing, isn't it? One of our teams. That's how the church grows. Reach out and bring people. So praise the Lord. And again, that was an amazing night. What a testimony. And some of our folks raised their hand to receive Christ so our students did. So right. praise the Lord. So keep them in prayer. So I think we're going to receive the offer. Come ahead, Pastor Jose. This time I'd like to ask for our ushers to come up. Father, we thank you for these tithes and these offerings. Father, we ask that you bless those that are listening to you and stepping out of the faith and giving the tithe and giving above that to various offerings as you've led on their heart. Father, we ask that you be with us as a church and help us to be wise with the money that you're giving us so that we can fund the church in the way that you're calling us to do. In your name we pray these things, Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, Kathy. That was great. A few years ago, they, they, these some of these fellows, there were some others, and some, I guess, are moving away now, but uh, we, we started a little men's group called Voices and Parades. And we just kind of recently, some of you know, tried to resurrect the, 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 the guys together and, and do the best we can. And this is one of our favorite songs. I think I can have to say that for all of us. I hope it blesses your heart today. Read the scripture with me. In the name of the Lord. Revelations 1.8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is was and who is to come. The Lord. Yeah. 
great. Thank you. Please turn in your Bible, if you would, to Genesis chapter 2. If you're using a, a cell phone or electronic device, uh, that's fine. When we get done with that, I would just encourage you to put it away so you can concentrate. That's just, that's just good protocol, because I want to preach the Word this morning, and I want you to hear it, retain it, and be blessed by it. And I love you. Genesis 2 and I'm going to begin reading at verse 18. Genesis 2, verse 18. And the title of the message this morning is Marriage, God's Beautiful Gift. Marriage, God's Beautiful Gift. Amen? Let's stand in honor of God's Word. Genesis 2, beginning at verse 18. This is the Word of the Lord. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Marriage is your beautiful gift, Father. You created the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. You placed them in a beautiful garden. You brought them together and they became one flesh. It's my prayer that your beautiful gift of marriage will be lifted up, what you've created. And you'll bless every marriage within this hearing. And those that one day will enter into a lifelong relationship of marriage, we pray, Lord, that we may serve and love you with all of our hearts, and may this be a blessing to us. Speak through your servant, for I am frail and weak and ineffectual, but with your Holy Spirit, your word will go deep into our hearts, and we will go live that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. In the Holy Word of God, we have an amazing record here of God's creation. He made everything out of nothing. God always has been and always will be. He was there creating with His Son and with the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that He called, let there be light, and there was light. He called for the oceans, the land, the trees. The sun, the moon, the stars, all living things, the great creatures of the sea and the land. And he made an amazing garden, the Garden of Eden. It was a paradise. If you ever wonder what heaven will be like, it will be more than you can ever imagine. It will be such a paradise, mind-blowing, beauty, and what God will create in his creating. And right in the middle of his creation, he creates a man and a woman. And he officiates the first marriage ceremony. The Bible says he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones 
and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Marriage is God's beautiful gift. Jesus Christ saved me from my sins when I was a boy. But he gave me a wife. And that wife has also been a part of my salvation story. 35 years ago, December 3rd, 1983, in Mount Vernon, Ohio, I said, I do. Now, 35 years is a young marriage for some of you that are here. Is there any here that have been married over 50 years? Let me see a show of hands. Look at that. Praise the Lord. Amen. Any that have been married over 60 years, let me see a show of hands. Oh, praise the Lord. Right. You that were married over 60 years, I know Carl, you would have been 67 and a half, is that correct? Him and I were just talking about that this week. John, how long for you all? 66. 66. Praise the Lord. Lewis, how long for you guys? Lewis and Ruth? 64, praise the Lord. Who else? Is there anybody else over 60? Marriage over 60 years? Don, how long? 65. 65 years. Praise the Lord. That's amazing. Did I miss anybody that's been married over 60 years? Oh, right over here, Jerry, how long? 61 years. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. God is good. Did I miss anybody else? That's, that is an amazing accomplishment. Now, some of you, I know that you miss your spouse. Your spouse has went on to be with the Lord. And that's hard. And some of you are not married. And the Bible says you can devote yourself fully to the Lord. And we appreciate that in you. And some of you one day will enjoy God's beautiful gift of marriage. How does God fuse a man and a woman together for a lifetime? What are the ingredients? What will it take to have a marriage that will last a lifetime? Before I share some simple thoughts with you, let me share a little joke with you. I think this is a pretty good story. Once there was a millionaire who collected live alligators. He kept them in the pool at the back of his mansion. The millionaire also had a beautiful daughter, and she was single. One day he decided to throw a huge party, and during the party he announces, My dear guest, I have a proposition to every man here. I will give one million dollars or my daughter to the man who can swim across this pool full of alligators and emerge alive. As soon as he had finished his last word, there was a sound of a large splash. There was one guy in the pool swimming with all that he could and screaming out of fear. The crowd cheered him on as he kept stroking and swimming and as if he was running for his life. Finally, he made it to the other side with only a, t a torn short and a shirt and a few minor lacerations. And the millionaire was incredibly impressed. He said, my boy, that was incredible. Fantastic. I didn't think it could be done. Well, I must keep my end of the bargain. Do you want my daughter or do you want the one million dollars? The guy says, listen, I don't want your money, nor do I want your daughter. I want the person who pushed me in the water. <laughs> oh. What does it take to fuse together a man and a woman for a lifetime? And write these things down if you would. They're your testimony. And they can be your testimony as you approach marriage one day. The first thing that it will take for a marriage that will last a lifetime, a marriage performed by God where He's the witness and He gets the glory, it will take a miracle. It will take a miracle. But it's a miracle that God will do. You see, you're swimming uphill. You're, you're climbing uphill. You're swimming against the stream. The culture that we live in denigrates marriage. It mocks marriage. There are failed marriages all around us. There's the trials of life, and there's differences, and there's temptations. And then I will tell you that the forces of hell 
will come against a marriage. But the Bible says, what shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. And to fuse a man and a woman together for a lifetime marriage will take a miracle, but it's a miracle that God will do. Can I get an amen? amen. The second thing is respecting your unique differences. I think a lot of us, through some of our marriage, we try to change our spouse. And instead of respecting their differences and their uniqueness, we try to change them. I know my wife has been trying to refine me for a lot of years. And you know the only time I get compliments on how I look is when she dresses me. So there can be that aspect which we greatly appreciate. Amen? Do you know that there are unique differences between a man and a woman? Here's just a few. Men and women differ in, are different in every cell of their body. There's differences in chromosomes, which their combinations can be the basic cause of male or female. In the United States, a woman lives longer than a man. The basal metabolism of a woman is normally lower than a man. The skeletal structure of a man and a woman are different. A woman has larger stomach, kidneys, and liver, and appendix, and smaller lungs than a man. The functions of a woman that are lacking in a man influence behavior and feelings, hormonal differences that cause women to have a more larger active thyroid associated with smooth skin, but they're more vulnerable to laugh and to cry easily. A woman's blood contains more water, 20% fewer red cells, and these supply oxygen to the body cells, and so a woman tires more easily and is more prone to fainting. In brute strength, men are 50% above women. A woman's heart beats more rapidly. The blood pressure is lower than a man, and she has less tendency to high blood pressure. Her vital capacity, the breathing power, is lower than a man at a 7 to 10 <coughs> ratio. A woman can stand high temperature better than a man. Her metabolism slows down less. There's psychological differences. There's emotional differences. There's physiological differences. And the needs of a man and woman are different, aren't they? I came across a book many years ago by Willard Harley called His Needs, Her Needs. I've used it many times in marriage counseling. The most basic needs that he found of a, of, of a woman in a marriage were these, the following, and maybe not necessarily in this order. Affection, conversation, honesty and openness, secure finances, and family support. The five most basic needs for a man in a marriage, and not necessarily in this order, sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, attractiveness, a peaceful and quiet home, and admiration. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And you know, when we think of the season of Lent, Lent is about giving something up so that Jesus becomes all. It might be food, it might be some, your electronic device, it might be a, a TV show, whatever it may be. I think a great sacrifice is knowing and finding out what your mates, your spouse's needs are and desiring to meet those needs. Amen? Find out what those needs are and desire to meet those needs. Instead of clashing, respecting, and relishing the uniqueness of each other, what I want you to do if you're married right now is turn to your spouse and say, I love you just the way you are. Amen. Amen. So building a lifelong marriage fused together by God is a miracle. It takes a miracle. It takes respecting each other's unique differences. And third, it takes a Christ-centered home. A Christ-centered home. When each spouse is deeply committed to Christ, you have an enormous advantage over families that don't have that. Jesus Christ will make an amazing difference in your marriage. Can I get an amen? amen. A Christ-centered home. Again and again when I talk to people, maybe they're having some marital stress, some pressure. 
Again and again, I tell them there are a couple simple things that you can do. And when I asked them later, are you doing those things? They said, yes, I'm doing those things, and it's making a difference. I think it's part of a Christ-centered home. One of those things are to read the Bible and pray together. Read the Bible and pray together. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. I love to hear my wife pray. I love to hear her pray even more now since she's been diagnosed with cancer. Pray whenever that is comfortable for you. For some men that's hard. Then when you turn out the lights and you're laying in bed, and start praying together. Turn on some nice music. Whatever it takes. Pray together. Read the Word of God together. The second thing in this Christ-centered home is keep on dating each other. And when I say dating each other, put your phone down, look each other in the eye, and tell each other how much you love her or him. Amen? Let them know. Celebrate them. I love you and you are God's beautiful gift to me. Pray every day together. Join your hearts together. Another thing of a Christ-centered home is knowing your godly role according to the Bible. And I pray this about my marriage every day, and I pray this about my church family and my own family, all my extended family, every day. Husbands, Ephesians 5, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, you are to honor and submit to your husbands as to the Lord. That is the biblical plan, and that's part of a Christ-centered home. Remember that a Christ-centered home is symbolic of Jesus returning for His church. He's returning for His bride, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ will return for us. And His return is very soon. And He will take us to be with Him in heaven forever in an unbelievable, indescribable eternity. The Bible says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I encourage you, a marriage that God can knit together for a lifetime, it will take a miracle, but it's one that God can and He will do. He will. It will take celebrating your unique differences. Not trying to change each other, but celebrating who you are. And it will take a Christ-centered home. The fourth thing, it will take a committed love. It will take a committed love. There's going to be storms. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be stress. It will come upon your marriage. There will become differences. There'll become differences in the way that you were raised and how you grew up. And if you have an iron will determination that you're going to commit to your spouse and only death will separate you, that's what it's going to take. Amen? An iron will committed love. How many of you have been up in the St. Louis Arch? Let me see a show of hands. They call it the Gateway to the West. I've been up in it many times. Used to live out in Kansas City. Came through there to head back to Ohio, back and forth. That St. Louis Arch can withstand winds of up over 200 miles an hour. They said it can, it can withstand major earth shifts. And the strength of the St. Louis Arch, which is this massive arch right along the river, the strength is not in its foundation. It's not in how deep that they put it down to the ground and what materials they used. And it's not in the materials that they made to put it up. They said the strength of it is that two parts came together and met right in the middle. And that is where the strength of the St. Louis Arch is. Your strength in your marriage is an iron will commitment. I will choose to love you forever. It doesn't mean you'll always feel it. Feelings come and go. When people say, and Hollywood says, and portrays with their romantic movies, I've fallen out of love with you, and now I've went to this love. You don't fall out of love. You choose 
to no longer love that person. Love is an action word. It is a word where you choose to make a commitment of iron will determination. And that's what makes a marriage for a lifetime. Amen? So it will take a miracle. It will take respecting each other's differences. A Christ-centered home. And a committed love. And then last, there's this important thing called communication. Talk it out. Talk it out. When you talk it out, there's going to be times you're going to say, I'm sorry. And you need to do that. Amen? And there's going to be times that you're going to need to say, I forgive you. Talk it out. Marriage is God's beautiful gift. I use a little book in some of my marriage counseling called The 15-Minute Marriage. And the counselor that has counseled thousands of couples and dealt with many relationships and worked in marriage for all of his life, he said that he found a formula that makes all the difference in a marriage. 15 minutes, twice a day, face to face, he said it makes a huge difference in your marriage. Communication. Marriage is God's beautiful gift. It's amazing that he can take the raw materials of two imperfect human beings, two distinctly unique personalities, and bring them together. Now, you know you're going to have to work at it. You know that. Years ago, I called my buddy up and said, bring your rototiller over. I've got mine. What are we going to do? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to plot a, a big garden. How big do you want it? I showed him. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm sure. And we went out there and began to use those rototillers and tore up that soil and just ripped it up in this area. And I, when we got all done, I looked at it and I thought, whoa, wow, that is a little bigger than I thought. <laughs> Maybe I should have listened to it. And I was a seminary student working on my Master's of Divinity degree. And I was working at a bank full time. And I was very busy. We were having children. And uh, needless to say, what was a garden that I planted began to get away from me. And the more I looked down there, the more it reminded me. I looked down from up in my house and looked down, my yard sloped down, and I just kept seeing weeds and more weeds and more weeds. And I learned a lesson from that. Marriage is like a garden. And what you do with it, what you make it, how you tend that garden, how you give it the proper amount of time and energy, and meeting the needs that I shared with you that each other have. And sacrificial love. And how you do that. That marriage can be like a garden that brings amazing life. Vegetables. And life giving to pass out to others. And for the glory of God. Or that marriage can be left unattended. And it doesn't look too good. Someone wrote this. Life can't give me joy and peace. It's up to me to will it. Life just gives me time and space. It's up to me to fill it. Your marriage can be a beautiful garden. One that God says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of a man. That is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Marriage, God's amazing gift. 35 years ago, God knew what I needed. He gave me a young lady named Lisa Bowman. She became Lisa Cook. I lifted her up over the threshold. We shared the joy of intimacy. We have built a family, a life, and a legacy. It does take a miracle. But it's one that God will do. Amen. It takes celebrating our unique differences. It takes a Christ-centered home, committed love, and communication. If you agree, say amen. amen. Now, all of you that are married, stand and face each other. I'm going to have you repeat your vows today. Isn't that beautiful? All of you that are married, stand and face each other. You can't stand sit and face each other. 
This is a beautiful sight. All right, you men, I'm going to start with you. So you men, get your game face on. Okay? So when I say I, blank, take you blank, you're going to say it. Okay, you ready? I, I take you to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward. Hold hands for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to death do us part, according to God's holy command. And thereto, I pledge you my faith. Amen. All right, ladies, you get that beautiful face on. Here we go. You insert your name and his name. I take you to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part, according to God's holy command. And thereto, I pledge you my faith. Let's give him a hand. congregation stand as well. We're going to have a special prayer. We're going to have a special prayer right now. Blessing over these parents. Alright, let's bow our heads together. Let's bow our heads. For you that would love to have had your spouse here, we're sorry. We pray for you. We love you. For you that have suffered a divorce, we're also sorry. God heals. He blesses. And he'll help you. For you that will one day be married, we're excited for you. It's God's incredible gift. For you that aren't married, we appreciate your service. You're devoted to the Lord alone. And we love you and celebrate that. Let's pray. Almighty God, lay your mighty hands upon these that are married here. May they sense the blessing and the joy of the Lord. I always share with couples to use the 50 to 1 principle. For every one negative comment, you say 50 wonderful things to your spouse first. I pray that they'll speak words of love and encouragement and they'll say them. I pray they'll not withhold anything from their spouse. They'll love them. They'll serve them. They'll find out what their needs are and bless these marriages. And those, Lord, that will one day be married, may they look ahead to God's beautiful gift. It is amazing. Thank you for those, Lord, that can say over 60 years, 67 and a half, and 66, 65, 61, 63. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, God. And it does take a miracle and one that you will do. It takes respecting each other's differences and uniqueness. May we have Christ-centered homes. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And may we have an ironclad commitment that only death will separate us. And may we communicate and share from our hearts. Bless our marriages. And we'll give you all the thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Our prime timers are now heading to the Family Life Center for a celebration.